Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, so now we can see. Okay, uh, okay. So I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to speak on this occasion. And I would also like to convey my best wishes to Sergio. I had a chance to work with him for a short period when I was a postdoc with Andrea in, in CISA. And uh, it was a great learning opportunity for me. And in fact, my introduction to statistical field theory was through some note of his, which Andrea shared with me on non trivial lattice cases. And then we are worked on it for, for a while. But uh, today's talk will be on a on a completely different topic. Uh, it will be on uh, activity-driven transport in harmonic chains. So this talk is based on these papers, uh, and which was done with uh, which were done with uh, two PhD students, Ayan Shatra and uh, Ritik Shankar. So uh, yeah, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk about activity-driven harmonic uh, chains and the energy transport in that. So first, I would give a very brief review of, of uh, usual thermally driven harmonic chains and the transport in there. And then I'll introduce uh, this model. And uh, depending on how much time I have, I'll discuss certain properties of the stationary non-equilibrium station state that uh, result uh, for such a system. So yeah, so whenever we talk about energy transport in one dimension, typically we have a, a picture in mind that there's a macroscopic system which is subjected to a temperature gradient and energy is a heat or energy is flowing through the system. So um, often a simple theoretical model for, for such a phenomenon is used where one models the system, the macroscopic system by a chain of uh, oscillators which are connected to, to equilibrium thermal reservoirs at the two ends with two different temperatures. Of course, the reservoirs being equilibrium means that the connections have to satisfy fluctuation theorem, uh, dissipation theorem at each end. And the relevant questions are, uh, how does the energy current behave? What is the thermal conductivity? Is there a Fourier law? Uh, can one systematically define, uh, consistently define a local temperature? And what are the fluctuations of velocity and current? So the paradigmatic example of, of uh, such a system, which was uh, studied in 1967, is the harmonic chain uh, connected to Langeva path. And so this was studied by Ryder, Lebois, and Lee, and they actually solved this uh, system exactly. So I'll give uh, the results first, but let me introduce the model a bit more uh, in details. So we have a chain of n harmonically coupled oscillators. So here, this is a schematic diagram blue dots are my, my oscillators. And they are connected, the first oscillator is connected to a thermal bath of temperature T1, and the last one is connected to a thermal bath of temperature Tn. And when T1 is not equal to Tn, uh, we expect that uh, there will be current going through the system. And we, I mean, the, the baths were modeled by simple uh, Langevin dynamics. So this is the Langevin equations for the oscillators. So uh, on, the, on the boundary oscillators, we have these two forces, this minus gamma uh, V1, this is the dissipative force. And then there's a random noise, white uh, noise, uh, which is also coming from the from the bath. So these two are related, as you can see, and that's the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which must hold for a for a uh, for an equilibrium bath. And uh, there are of course various uh, different models of of the bath, but we will stick with this simple one. And uh, this was the one studied in in uh, 1967. And what they showed is that uh, in the uh, thermodynamic limit, so number of oscillators going to infinity. Uh, there is still a current flowing through the system. So Fourier law doesn't hold actually. And the, that current is proportional to the temperature difference. And moreover, one can define a, a local kinetic temperature, which remains uniform in the bulk at, as the average, energy, average temperature of the two, two reservoirs. So the question that uh, we are going to ask today is what happens when these reservoirs are, are away from equilibrium, when they do not satisfy fluctuation dissipation theorem? In particular, what happens when these reservoirs are active reservoirs? So what I mean by active reservoirs is that uh, I'm just thinking of a medium which is uh, consisting of self-propelled active particles, active particles like bacteria or genus particles. Um, so they are inherently non-equilibrium in nature. And uh, actually, uh, so motion of single probe particles in active reservoirs are being studied, uh, I mean, very much in current days, both theoretically and experimentally. And they show a lot, uh, host of intriguing features like uh, emergence of memory, negative friction, and all these uh, features. So we are basically asking the next question, which is what happens when we connect a, a system between two such active reservoirs? How does the transport property of the system uh, changes compared to when we have uh, two equilibrium reservoirs? 
And what we are going to do is uh, we are going to take a very simple linear model. Uh, so again, a harmonic chain, and we'll model the active reservoirs with some simple uh, colored noise. Okay, so this is a schematic diagram of, of the system that uh, I'm talking about. So again, uh, let's come back to the model. So we have exactly the same setup, uh, a chain of N oscillators coupled to two reservoirs. Now, additionally, we have two extra forces on the boundary reservoirs. I hope you can see my cursor. So there are these uh, forces F1 and Fn acting on the boundary, uh, boundary oscillators, and they do not satisfy uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem with the dissipation. So here is the Langevin equation. So these additional forces are here. And uh, we take a very simple model in the sense that we assume that these forces are exponent. They are independent of each other. First of all, F1 and Fn are independent of each other, but they have their <coughs> they are correlated among themselves. There's an uh, there's a non-trivial autocorrelation which decays exponentially. So that's the simplest model. Okay, and this this time scales of the autocorrelation, which we call tau one and tau n, they are the sort of measures of of reservoir activity. Of course, in the limit uh, when this uh, time scale uh, time scales go to zero, we expect some sort of a passive limit. But uh, when this is finite, we expect that there should be some effect on the transport behavior of of this uh, simple system. So, uh, uh, before going to the detailed calculation, let me first uh, mention that uh, one can of course have various different dynamical models for for such force. Just saying the two point correlations do not define the force completely. So I'll be considering three uh, well-known cases uh, of active processes, which gives uh, rise to this, uh, which give rise to this kind of exponential correlation. First is the run and tumble process, where the force is simply a dichotomous uh, uh, variable, which flips with a certain rate alpha, and the corresponding time scale is actually inverse of that rate alpha, two times, uh, I mean inverse of two times that rate alpha. Another very common, uh, I mean, well-known process is the so-called active Brownian process which is given by this Langevin equation. Uh, so even though these two run and tumble process and active Brownian process have the same sort of two point correlation, uh, their actual statistics, higher order correlations are very different. Okay, and then we have uh, uh, active Ohmstein lunenberg process, which is again, uh, very well known, uh, which is a Gaussian process. So all three of them have the same uh, two point correlation, but the fluctuations, I mean, the higher order fluctuations are very different. And we want to see what happens when we uh, drive a harmonic chain with uh, this, uh, this kind of forces. In particular, we'll look at uh, average energy current, temperature profile, and if time permits, uh, current fluctuations also. Um, how much time uh, do I have? Not much if you want to respect the time. So 10 minutes, it's okay. 10 minutes, yeah. So, okay. So I'll not go into any details of the of the calculation, but um, I'm just going to give the result. So of course, this driving leads to a stationary state and uh, where uh, there's an energy current flowing through the, uh, through the system. And uh, so because there is no source of dissipation in the bulk, so this, it's the same constant average current which flows through, through the whole system. And because of the linear nature of the system, uh, one can actually solve it exactly, at least find the average current uh, exactly for all uh, kinds of driving. And uh, it turns out that, uh, I mean, the current actually naturally splits into two parts. One is the thermal part, which is exactly same as the RLN result, proportional to T1 minus uh, Tn. And then there is the active part. And this is what we are uh, most interested in. So basically, we are going to put T1 equal to Tn equal to zero for the rest of the talk and uh, just talk about the activity uh, driven behavior. So one can show that the active current uh, can be expressed in a form which is given here. So we have this uh, Lorentzian spectra, this is coming from the reservoirs. So th this is the difference of the uh, spectral function of the two reservoirs. And this is different uh, from the thermal driven case exactly here. For thermal driven case, this, this spectra is, uh, is uniform. So here the presence of this Lorentzian spectra actually gives rise to uh, rather uh, curious behavior of the average current. And uh, I mean, this is the exact form of the, of the current in the n going to infinity limit, which is completely independent of the specific dynamics which we're using for, for the force. So this result is quite robust. As long as there's an exponential correlation, we'll have this current. Uh, I mean, form of the current will be same. So if we plot this current as a function of uh, one reservoir activity, keeping the other fixed, we see certain curious features. 
first of all, uh, it, it, it's a non-monotonic function. So the current first increases and then decreases. Moreover, uh, uh, if you look here, there are these red points which uh, show the, the points where the current reverse direction. Okay, so we have uh, current becoming negative at a certain point, which is not tau one equal to tau n. Of course, when tau one is equal to tau n, if we go across that point, we expect that the current direction will change. So these are the other uh, zeros here. But there is another non-trivial point where the current reverses this direction. So we have two features. One is the presence of this negative differential conductivity. So current is a non-monotonic function of, of uh, the activity. And there's a current reversal. So not only does it decrease, it also goes uh, below zero at certain non-trivial points. So these, these features were not seen in the thermally driven case at all. Okay, these are completely due to the uh, active nature of the, of the forcing. So uh, again, I'll not go into the details, but one can show that this comes really from the overlap of the system spectrum with the uh, with the reservoir spectra, with the um, I mean, Lorentzian reservoir spectra here. And uh, this overlap actually changes non-monotonically, which gives rise to the, to the non-monotonic behavior. And uh, depending on the, I mean, which reservoir wins, that sort of dictates the direction of the current. So here is a plot showing the, I mean, just the sign of the current on the tau one tau n plane. Uh, so if, if we look along this uh, red line, so we are changing tau one, keeping tau n fixed. So first we have negative current, then positive, then again negative. So this first reversal is, is really non-trivial. So we don't have a good physical understanding of, uh, I mean, uh, we have mathematical understanding, but not uh, any precise physical estimate for, I mean, when this, uh, this reversal occurs. We know it mathematically, but uh, I mean, other than that, other than the fact that okay, the two reservoirs are, are competing with the different uh, width of the of the spectrum, um, I mean that's what uh, gives rise to the reversal. And uh, yeah, I'll again skip some other details. So one can also compute an effective temperature profile. Actually, two effective temperature profiles by looking at the average kinetic energy and average potential energy of the oscillators, and this can again be uh, computed exactly. So uh, what we find is that, again, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, this uh, uh, kinetic temperature and potential temperatures become equal in the bulk of the system. This statement is, again, irrespective of the specific dynamics of the active force. Uh, although there are some uh, ex I mean, uh, exponential boundary layers where uh, kinetic and potential temperatures are not equal, but in bulk, it seems like there is some sort of an equipartition of energy even though, I mean, irrespective of the very non-equilibrium nature of the, of the driving. Okay. So in fact, the bulk temperature can be written in, in this form. So it's half some uh, tau one plus tau n. Uh, and that uh, naturally raises the question whether one can associate an effective temperature given by this, uh, this tau one and tau n to the active reservoirs. Because it's exactly in the same form as in the, in the thermal case where you have uh, the bulk temperature as the average of, of some numbers. So the answer to this question is uh, actually no. So there are certain significant dissimilarities between uh, the thermally driven case and the activity driven case. First of all, as I said, I mean, there's a non-trivial boundary layer, layer, even when the activities of the two reservoirs are same. So which is not seen in the thermally driven case at all. So if we have a, um, an oscillator chain with T1 equal to Tn at the two ends, the, the temperature profile will be completely flat. Here, this is not the case, uh, sorry. Um, so here, if you look at this orange plot, it's actually with tau one equal to tau n. So we still have a non-trivial uh, boundary layer. And uh, moreover, uh, so suppose we, I mean, by, by uh, I mean, we try to assign this, these numbers as effective temperatures, and then we compute the current that is expected for a thermally driven chain using this temperature. So here in this plot, the solid lines are the actual currents measured or calculated, and the dashed lines are the expected currents if we assign uh, these effective temperatures to the non-equilibrium paths. So clearly they don't match. Uh, I mean, this effective temperature picture is, is not valid in general. However, if you look at this brown uh, curve, here you see, so this is for a uh, low activity regime, small tau, this is tau n equal to 0 0.1. And when tau one is also small, you see that the two curves actually match. So for in the in the small activity limit, one can perhaps expect some sort of an effective uh, temperature picture. 
which can also be understood from the from the structure of the noise. So in the tau going to zero limit, this exponentially correlated noise actually becomes uh, delta correlated, and one can define an effective temperature. And we could also show explicitly that uh, the active, I mean the active current that we calculate exactly actually reduces to the well-known RLL form with these effective temperatures in the small activity limit. Okay. Uh, so if I have like two, two more minutes, I'll just uh, mention something else about the fluctuation. So we looked at the average uh, kinetic energy and average uh, active current. So what about higher order fluctuation? First of all, how is it different from uh, thermally driven case? And how are they different for different kinds of active drives? So it turns out that again, if we look at bulk only, there's no way to distinguish between different uh, active driven cases. The, the velocity distributions are actually completely Gaussian, irrespective of the specific form of the, of the driving, which is not true in boundary, of course, but uh, I'll not go into the details of that. And uh, more interestingly, at least for us, it was more surprising if we look at the, uh, the fluctuation of the, of the current in the bulk. So not only the average, but instantaneous current fluctuation, the whole distribution of it, uh, it turns out that uh, for three, I mean, all three, uh, uh, three models, these distributions are actually shape, uh, same in shape, qualitatively same. And not only that, they actually are consistent with Gaussian fluctuations in the bulk. I mean, Gaussian fluctuations of position and velocity in the bulk. Okay, so they have a logarithmic divergence for J equal to zero. So this is irrespective of the fact that J average is non-zero. So even, even when there is a non-zero average current, the distribution has uh, divergence, uh, logarithmic divergence near j equal to zero. And we could also calculate the, the full form of the distribution. And uh, again, I mean, if we, if we measure the current distributions in the boundary, then we see uh, very different features. But uh, I mean, already the fact that in the bulk, almost no signatures of activity are seen in the typical fluctuation, that is uh, uh, quite surprising for, for us actually. So yeah, I'll uh, skip this page and I'll just conclude. So what I have tried to tell you is about the energy transport of harmonic chain connected to active reservoirs. Uh, I mean, very simple models of active reservoirs where we have uh, a correlated noise, which we call active force acting on the, on the boundary oscillator. And we could uh, compute the average current and fluctuations and temperature profile exactly in this, uh, for this simple model. And the current actually shows certain curious uh, behavior like negative differential conductivity, and current reversal. Uh, but irrespective of this fact, the fluctuations of the, of the current are, are very similar to the thermally driven case, although the, the parameters are, are very different. And uh, there are certain universal bulk properties, like as I said, I mean, current fluctuations and local velocity fluctuations are, are consistent with the Gaussian measure in the bulk, although they are not the same in the boundary at all. Boundary oscillators can easily distinguish between different uh, forms of driving. There are many open questions. The first is to uh, see what happens if we use a more realistic model of, of the reservoir instead of this, <coughs> just one, uh, one simple force, but some sort of extended model. And do the NAC and the current reversal survive uh, in the presence of uh, disorder or anharmonicity and all this? So thank you for your attention and, and also uh, uh, congratulations to Sergio again on his birthday. Thank you very much, Una. For these are interesting results. So are there questions from uh, the audience? Uh, Andrea? Urna, have you checked if the sort of effective temperature that you get as far as I understood from sort of equipartition or similar, if you, if you get it also from uh, um, perturbation dissipation relations? relations? Uh, uh, no, I have not checked. But on the other hand, what I know is that the, the autocorrelation of the, uh, I mean, if I look at two time correlations in the bulk, that actually have some signature of activity. So I don't expect uh, fluctuation distribution to hold in the bulk. Okay. Also, okay. there's a current flowing through the system, right? Yeah. But we haven't checked it explicitly yet. It, that, that's on the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Great. Since it's quite late, uh, I thank again Urna for, for a beautiful talk and interesting results.